All right, welcome. 2022, if 2021 made you want to jump off a building, 2022 is just going to make you want to find a taller one. I'm mainly going to focus on some things that I've been asked through the off season and mainly key points that I do think you need to consider going into this year. This is strictly a cup series video. Obviously, we'll break down the track and Xfinity later in the month. I'll release some uh, Patreon information probably in the coming weeks, probably in the next week and a half, two weeks, give or take. But I mainly want to focus on this. I've been asked a lot about this type of stuff in the off season, and I think doing this is just going to make it easier for me to make content moving forward because I've already addressed all of this stuff. So focusing on the test data that we've seen at Charlotte, that we've seen them even when they, when they went to uh, Bowman Gray Stadium and everything, like, look, if you're asking me for lap by lap data for, from that, you're a clown. Like, all that data is really, really useless. Not only was the next-gen car not ready, NASCAR didn't even know what they wanted. They didn't even know the product that they wanted to use. They didn't know the motor. They didn't know what they wanted to do aero-wise. They didn't know what spoiler they wanted to use. They had cars out there with different configurations, even in terms of the tailpipes, in terms of the spoiler height, in terms of the spoiler thickness, in terms of if they're running shark fins down the back, where the air ducts were, on top of you know early steering issues that they had. Like Everything in that, certainly the Charlotte tests, are absolutely useless for DFS data. I don't care if somebody was the fastest in early runs. I don't care what, you know, speaking of NASCAR reporters being a joke, I don't care what the videos looked like from some dude living up in the uh, Charlotte condos at the track because NASCAR reporters don't report anything. Um, I think the best data that we're still gonna find this year is from the actual races. And so please stop asking me for test data. Like this stuff is really, really useless. If anything, maybe the eyeball test, but that's it. On top of that, it's an entirely new different car for everyone. Different drivers are at different teams. Like, stop relying so much on the test data. How many times did we, and even now, how many times have we clicked on a Goodyear tire test article or anything related to tire tests or car testing, and then you read it, and there's no actual information because, yet again, NASCAR reporters are a joke. They don't really report anything. Um, moving on, like, this is kind of a uh, personal story for me real quick. So... Back when we used to test, we would go, you know, before the season started and everything, we, Donovan and I unloaded, and he had the fastest modified early in the season, early in the test session. I mean, we were pulling away from people, you know. People were coming over like, what did you do to this car? Why are you going so fast? You know, we started looking around the car, and we're just destroying the, uh, the, the quick change transmission, you know, where you have the rear axle and that back plate you can, uh, you can take the bolts off of and change the gears. Our chassis was actually um, whacking against that. And so... Yeah, sure, we may have been the fastest car, you know, early in test data, but if we ran that car during a race, we would have destroyed the car. And so, like, you need to pay attention. Like, look in between the lines of this test data stuff, you know? I, I've already had people send me, like, well, if you look at where Kyle Larson was, and, it, like, who cares? Who ca Like, this is absolutely useless. Do not focus on any of the test data at all. Secondly, we're bringing back practice and qualifying. It's not even a real practice. You know, it's, it's a warm-up. It's basically NASCAR saying, hey, we don't want you guys basically not even getting on the grid. We'll give you, you know, a 15-minute warm-up session. Then we'll do our, you know, really, really overly complicated qualifying system. Brandon, if you just read, yeah, I understand. I can read. Like, I understand what they're going to do week to week, but it's, it's, it's overly complicated. There's absolutely no reason for that. Who watches this stuff anyway? Outside of people like me, outside of people like you, who is watching this stuff? But, so when we're looking at practice data this year, I think it's going to be very rare to have a lot of 15 lap um, practice data, or maybe you get one long run. You know, used to whenever you had mo certainly multiple practice sessions, and there are some tracks this year that we will have, you know, a full 50 minute practice session, but we're not going to really see that. The, the data that you want to look at is, is the race by race, lap by lap data, and we'll get to that when I kind of like the schedule here, but this practice session, like, it's still we're still gonna be looking at kind of like shorter runs in these practice sessions maybe the longest laps that we get certainly on on some of the bigger tracks might be like eight laps you know if these guys unload and something is wrong with the car they don't have a whole lot of time to go back to the garage and change anything it's still kind of you know we're gonna race with what you arrive with might be making some changes in qualifying but still I don't think we're gonna see a lot from that so don't over don't overreact to the practice data that we see because a lot of that is gonna be short run data um, regarding that as well, you know, I really want to throw out the last year's data for a lot of the Gen 6, or actually for, 
In my opinion, I would throw out all data from previous years, honest to God, outside of track uh, history, maybe for certain tracks, maybe like Martinsville, or even when you look at road courses in a career sense, maybe keep that. But I'm throwing out a lot of last year's data. Not only are we running an entirely different car, we're running entirely different setups. It, it makes no real sense to me to really stay on the uh, where these drivers were last year. One thing that I really get annoyed with, yet again, when it comes to NASCAR reporters actually, you know, explaining things, and this is all very oversimplified, but for the sake of my explanation here. So we're running different tires this year. Obviously, we're running a low profile tire, and so it's a lot wider um, than it was last year. So previously, we were basically running a tire that had tall sidewalls, and for all extents and purposes, it was a, it was a pretty short tire, at least width-wise. And so in that, you know, these tires have some... They didn't have a ton, but in the sense of the driver's standpoint, whenever you would enter a corner, like going to the right, you would you would have the wheels kind of have some give and take and stuff, where the sidewall would kind of flex a little bit. Now we're running a, a wider tire with a shorter sidewall. We don't have we don't necessarily have that flex anymore. And so when you're looking at the guys who are spinning out at Charlotte and the and specifically the drivers who are just spin out by themselves, it's mainly because that no these cars aren't harder to drive They're, these drivers are just not understanding where the slip angle is anymore and what makes me mad is that goodyear has this data i know that there's teams that have this data or they've at least figured it out and nobody's reporting on it this ain't even like dfs i'm just curious about this when you look at this graph obviously you know when you have a lot of grip it obviously decreases with the tire a uh, lot, lot loss of traction, you know, it obviously increases with the lack of grip that you have. Where this dot is is where the slip angle is. And so when you have, you know, the tire against whatever surface you're on, the friction that you have against it giving you grip, whenever you finally lose that traction, that's where the slip angle is. Where has this dot moved, NASCAR? I don't know. I would like to see somebody report on something related to where this is. Why are certain drivers having more issues than other ones? We've seen Tyler Reddick have a lot of issues. We've seen Kyle Busch have issues. We've seen, um, you know, even Austin Dillon as well. Like certain driving styles are not um, translating to this tire as much. It's not necessarily the car because this car is still, it's still really aerodynamic. I don't care what, it, what NASCAR tells us or wants us to think. It's really based on aero and it's really based on how far these drivers can push these tires. And so like, where is this now? NASCAR, come on, help us out here. You know, I'm just curious about this. Outside of that, the reason yet again, and I understand I'm kind of regurgitating information or at least explaining things in a very simple fashion, but I just want to clarify all this stuff so I don't have to talk about it moving forward when I'm making my other videos this year. Going back to using entirely different setups and why I don't want to use really any of the data uh, last year because they're entirely new cars. Obviously, this is oversimplicated or oversimplified. When you look at the old frame that the cars would use, the only parts that you would kind of adjust, obviously, go in more detail, but specifically, you only had really two corners you had to work with. You know, the front end, how the front end reacted to the corners, where you put the cam, where you put the caster, yada, yada, yada. And whenever you would see guys hit the wall or blow a tire, you would typically see, you know, the front end get absolutely destroyed or it would severely hurt how that car performed. NASCAR obviously moved to the rear independent rear suspension this year, which is basically having control arms on every single corner of the car. In my opinion, I don't believe that that is going to provide, you know, the side-by-side -side racing action that NASCAR wants. Just run the Xfinity Series car. Just run the old-fashioned car. Not only do you now have more corners to worry about destroying or having issues, you make any, 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 any impact on any of these corners, it's going to completely change how that car handles. All these corners are still really sensitive. An issue that I haven't seen be talked about a whole lot is how strong this rear end is. You know, like, um, moving on, obviously, oversimplification, oversimplified version of control arms and everything, but that's an issue. Like, when you look at different types of cars that have run not interesting suspension but like when you look at legend cars for example like usa legend cars and stuff they are known for having spindles and control arms that are basically made out of styrofoam that's a concern that teams have had and that's really something i haven't seen reported or i doubt that nascar is really focusing on that because their version or at least how they you know 
explain the Austin Dillon wreck is that, well, you can just replace all this stuff, you know? It saves the car, you know? This, these corners crush and it, it helps save the frame so the teams can reuse the car. Well, you know what that means? That means whenever a driver gets into a wreck in a race, that driver's gonna be out. I believe that these cars are way more sensitive to damage and I don't think we're gonna see nearly as many guys, you know, survive as in the car surviving wrecks as we've seen in the past. So yet again, it, it moves to, I don't think that we're gonna see a lot of drivers like really jump into like involving a lot of contact. Obviously we're going to the LA Coliseum, we're going to dirt in these, a lot of, lot of things that I can see failing very easily, or at least having issues here. And so when we look at last year and how, you know, they didn't have practice. They really don't have practice this year. It's more so you better hope you arrive at the track with a car that's actually gonna race well or you're kind of SOL. And on top of that, not only did you used to have two corners that you really had to worry about, now you got all four corners. Like if one of these, if anything happens, any slight contact, you blow a tire, heaven forbid you blow, you have a flat, you know, that tire is gonna start ripping stuff apart even more so than it used to. And so, you know, moving on to the Cup Series and moving on to really entering this year, like, we're basically racing, at least in my opinion, with styrofoam cars, with styrofoam suspensions, and um, basically all these teams are learning. They're starting from they're starting from brand new. They they don't have any any setups. When you look at the schedule, like yet again, we don't have practice. We don't have real practice. When you look at the schedule, LA is not going to transfer anywhere. You can argue. I I would be open to the argument that you could use how the rear end you know, or at least um, the exits of the corner, you know, might translate to Martinsville, might. But if anything, at LA, you're running a second gear setup, you know, you can, you can lay the hammer down and you're only laying the hammer down for maybe three, maybe three and a half seconds. At Martinsville, it's a bit more than that. So even so, like when you look at LA and Martinsville, I don't really see a whole lot of uh, comparisons you can use. And I know for a fact that we're going to see that when we get to Martinsville in April, we're going to have guys specifically looking at the LA Coliseum data and I don't necessarily want to do that. Same thing with LA. Personally, I don't want to focus a ton on the Coliseum, on the Clash. Like I think that's a big waste of time obviously. Honestly, especially when Speed Weeks is 2 weeks away from that and we have other races I want to focus on like LA is at the very bottom of my totem pole of really putting in a lot of time to dive into this data, to dive into this weekend because we're gonna have all 40 car, or at least all the charter teams, you know, at least practice Saturday at the LA Coliseum, and then they're only taking what 25 cars, something off the top of my head. I can't remember. Don't quote me on that. I'm pretty sure it's 25. Um, with Larson being the only guy locked in because it's guaranteed, you know, whoever isn't locked in, the highest finisher in the points last year that isn't locked into the race will get in. So really, Larson's the only guy kind of locked in. So maybe you look into more into his data entering that, but. With only you know a certain amount of cars in that race, why am I going to really waste time digging in the data before, where I can just look at who qualifies into the LA Coliseum race and then look at their data and then look at their practice stuff? That's what I would do. And so I'm not really into looking at LA a ton. When we look at Daytona, obviously no, there's no lap by the way. there's no data from Daytona to use. When we go to Auto Club, these guys haven't been here in two years with a brand new car. This track is not going to be there next year. Um, it's the oldest service in NASCAR right now. Like this, like what are we doing? We just have to hope that the guys actually show up with a good car, you know, hoping that they take whatever data that I guess they could use from last year, even though it's completely different, you know, take it up to Auto Club. When we go to Vegas, you know, Vegas does not race like any of these guys. Brand new team or brand new track. Like we're not going to see a lot of data that you can use from that. When we go to Phoenix, you know, you're not going to be able to use. The Coliseum data for Phoenix, like, so a brand new track. Yet again, Atlanta, they're uh, testing this week on the 6th of January, um, which is another thing. Man, I miss speed. Like, this this whole offseason has really made me miss speed. I remember watching the Gen 6 and how heavily covered the Gen 6 test testing was, whether it was at Daytona, whether it was at other tracks even when they were covering um, trucks going to Eldora for the first time, like Speed Channel was on that stuff, showing actually like racing, actually interviewing drivers, actually talking to teams and stuff. They're gonna go and practice at Atlanta with no TV coverage. We're gonna have, you know, Bob Cockris there, just, you know, 
bending <laughs> bending his knee to NASCAR. Uh, all these other reporters that, like, if it was any other sport, would be fired out of a cannon into a brick wall. Um, so I don't think we're going to learn a whole lot from the data or from the test in January to Atlanta. It's more so just seeing how this track reacts. And yet again, like, they kind of just threw this track together last minute. Um, they barely just finished paving it not even a week ago. So Atlanta, you know, oh, it's supposed to be a mini Daytona. Okay, well, you, everybody knows data at Daytona isn't reliable. What are we using for Atlanta there? When we go to Coda, you know, this is kind of why, like, even last year, I want to throw out all the data because last year, every single road course had an asterisk by it. It was all tainted in some form or fashion. If you wanted to look at data from last year's road courses, you had to find a specific green flag run to see where all these teams were. When you looked at the Daytona road course last year, obviously NASCAR threw a phantom yellow for rain. When you look at Coda, last year's Coda race, it was in the rain. We nearly killed two drivers. Like, okay, can't really use that data. When we look at Sonoma, you know, everybody wrecked at the end. And so yada, yada, yada. When you look at every single track they went to, they, they had an asterisk by it. And so more so if you're looking at road course data, look at it as a whole. Don't look at it necessarily as in one individual track or, um, uh, Robles compared to road courses. Just look at it all in general and then kind of get an idea of how these guys are finishing, but don't just rely heavily on that. When we go to Richmond, maybe, maybe the first place, we're in April right now, or at least end of March. No, remember, because this is in May. Richmond is about the only track that we might be able to look at when we went to Phoenix. And uh, you can argue that in there. Uh, obviously, Joe Gibbs has usually been better at Richmond than Phoenix as of late, but maybe like the only two tracks that we can actually look at entering you know the third month of the season or second month of the season is atlanta or not atlanta it's phoenix when we go to martinsville yet again maybe maybe build off of richmond um but still like if anything the short tracks are the places that we're probably going to have the most reliable data to start the race for the week the year with bristol dirt just throw that out. obviously just another joke of an event Talladega, yet again, not really usable data from any of these races here. And so at this point, we're in May. So we're basically a quarter of the season through, and all these teams are going to these tracks really for the first time, building off of a brand new car with practically no practice. And so the reason I'm talking about the schedule so much is I want to look at long run speeds at these individual tracks. And like, for example, like Phoenix, I want to specifically look at how these drivers are doing in the third stage of this race. When we go to Las Vegas, I want to see how these drivers are doing in the longest run at Las Vegas as we move further down the schedule. Outside of that, like, there's so many if, ands, or buts and question marks about the 2020 Cup Series season, at least, like, we're, I'm at least answering this stuff. I, I don't really want to rant about this stuff anymore. Um, Find data points that you want to look at. Find long run speeds in these races. You know, don't really rely, at least personally, don't I'm not really gonna rely off the practice data um, this year. The Gen 6 was not ready. These teams are still not fully ready. Not I think uh, last time I looked at it, I think Hendrick, Stuart Haas, and Pinsky were the teams that actually had all or most of the chassis done for the different race for the different track types. Um, heaven forbid they end up wrecking stuff yet again like oh you know the RCR gang put together Austin Dillon's car after the wreck you know but oh Austin, RCR you know they put the car together after Tyler Reddick's wreck at, it's like, okay that's still like they do not have a lot of cars they're just having to repair they're not really able to catch up we talk about that with the starting parks or not the starting parks but the more underfunded cars in the Xfinity series like when these guys are focusing on repairing cars and um, fixing issues that they've had in previous races they're not necessarily able to actually end up preparing on the new car that they have on you know really preparing the setups and um, outside of that regardless of where you fall or wh whatever you think of the Brandon Brown incident that we're seeing in NASCAR yet again a, a professional sports uh, I'll call it a league here or an organization has that many like has that much stuff in the air? How is there how is there that many mix-ups? We're on like day one of the new year, and NASCAR is already like, and there's already stories out of people saying like, oh, NASCAR, you know, 
approve this paint scheme, and the NASCAR didn't approve it, and the NASCAR approved it again. And like, why is it? Why is this so difficult? Why? Why is there so much uh, misinformation out there? Why? Why is NASCAR so incompetent? Like, I understand a lot of people don't like me just absolutely blasting NASCAR, but you can at least agree with me that NASCAR is incompetent at the very least. And so I would not be shocked if we even see more changes on these cars between right now January 2nd and the start of the season at LA um, and really these teams and NASCAR really needs to uh, have an idea of where they're gonna be you know really in, in two weeks like honest to God like for trucks Xfinity you're already preparing for Daytona right now like you have your car ready you have a setup you have everything started like in January, you know, we're we're really three and a half weeks out from the season between when teams start actually traveling for LA and everything. Um, this is the part where you should already have cars or ideas planned for at least at least up to Phoenix. And we're not there. We're still, you know, wasting time figuring out what exactly we want. Like NASCAR barely just gave them the green light for the six hundred plus horsepower package, like in December, you know, a month and a half out from the race season. Like what what are we doing here? So just expect random or not random things, but just expect a lot of uh, a lot of learning going on between this part of the schedule. Um, and for me, I'm focusing on on race data versus practice data, and I just wanted to put this out there so I don't really have to talk about it um, as I'm making other videos this weekend. So hopefully you guys enjoyed it, and uh, I look forward to actually seeing you guys again and making videos in January, or at least for the rest of this month, and then obviously you know continuing on for this year. I'll talk about Patreon and stuff, like I said, in probably about a week and a half, two weeks. And uh, yeah, thank you for watching. I hope you're having a good uh, new year and we'll see you guys later.